All right, ladies and gentlemen, in order to be successful for today's instruction, take out a whiteboard and your focus and study guide. Let's go. We have a lot to do. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the dude who kind of does cognitive development. On your whiteboard, who's the dude behind cognitive development? What you got, Luke? DJ, on your whiteboard, what is it? When a little kid doesn't understand and struggles with when peekaboo is occurring. What is the little kid struggling with with peekaboo? What do we got, Ian? Object permanence. Object permanence. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what stage do we develop logic? Where we can't trick a kid with, oh, which glasses has more in it? Good, I got one. Still one. Still one. Two, three, four. Jaden. Concrete operational. On your whiteboard, which one do we have? Egocentrism, centration. And what stage do we have? Egocentration and centrism or whatever. What is it, Hayden? Pre operational. On your whiteboard, what stage are you currently in, according to uh, PJ? Good. What is it, Caroline? Formal operational. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is what is it called uh, when you touch a baby's feet and it starts kicking in order to protect itself, but also to build muscle strength. Good. What is it, Nina? Uh, Babinski. On your whiteboard, what is it when the baby is looking for the nipple? Good. What is it, Curtis? Rooting on your whiteboard. What is it called when it's born in an eight? And they do it in order to protect itself. It's called a what? I got one. And it is like crushing all of you because of that. What is it? Uh, Kate. <coughs> Reflex. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the first sound a baby makes? That's what we left off yesterday. It is a universal sound. Every baby makes the same one, no matter where they're from. Jalissa, cooing on your whiteboard. Please tell me what is on your whiteboard. What is the name of the dude who believes that more language we exp uh, the, if we help a child learn things, they will become better people. If you were correct. What is it called when you help a child and eventually allow them and scaffold them to do it on their own? They can do anything. What is it, Alexis? I have no idea. Magowski. Magowski. All right, here we go. So, cooing is your first stage. It's a universal sound. Everyone does it. Your second stage is babbling. Depending on your language, this will dictate what type of syllables the baby makes. It's all based on syllables. Okay, that's what babbling is on. One word speech. They can say one word like cookie, dog, now, no, yes. Okay? They are not using full and complete. They can say literally one word. What? Okay, your next one is telegraphic. Me go now is a perfect example for your application on your study guide. Me go now is a telegraphic speech. Is it correct grammatically? No. But does it give you a complete thought? Yes. That's what telegraphic means. Telegraphic is a complete thought, but not grammatically correct. Okay? And then eventually we will have language acquisition where it governs the learning of language during infancy and early childhood. That's what learning acquisition is, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you got? This is all Chomsky. Ah, this is Chomsky, yeah. Okay. Now, every single baby is born with a temperament. Every
every single baby is born with a temperament. It's the behavior characteristics that are fairly well established at birth. Anyone here's parents describe them as a good baby, like a happy baby. Anyone here got labeled as a pain in the butt? Yeah, I'm right there with you, hell yeah. Anyone here has no idea? Anyone here hated to be with other people? There you go. So, there are three major ways that we discuss baby temperaments. You need to know this. The first way is easy. So if you were called an easy baby, you were regular, adaptable, and happy. You kind of just went with the flow. This is the ideal. Do we agree? Okay? If we were all plan out the perfect baby in the far, 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 far future, we'd all want happy babies. Then some of you, like myself, were difficult. We are irregular. We wake up at weird times, we go to bed at weird times. We are not adaptable. We don't like having changes to our plan. And we are very cranky, which means we cry all the time. For no reason. We just like to cry. Huh? It's typically your whole life. If you're a happy baby, you're typically a happy person now. Kind of go with the flow, you're typically low key. If you're a difficult person, baby, I don't like doing things out of my norm. Would you agree? I am super, super consistent. I don't do well with change at all. I wear the same outfits every week, people. Literally the same outfits, okay? And I am a cranky human being. If you piss me off, you're going to know in two seconds you cross that line. And that's who I am as a person. So, my temperament is difficult. But charming, but difficult. Then you have some people who are slow to warm up. So these are people who have gradually adjusted to change. These are people who do not like new people, who are highly suspicious of new people, who do not like being carried by other people other than their mom and their dad or the people who cared for them and loved them the most. Those are slow. Anyone in a slow to warm up? Here we go. Are you still suspicious of people today? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Absolutely. Your temperament is your foundation of your personality. Your temperament is your foundation of your personality. Absolutely. Bar none. Okay. Attachment. This is one of my favorite parts because I think it's fascinating. Okay, attachment is the emotional bond between an infant and the primary caregiver. Ladies and gentlemen, it says primary caregiver. Does it have to be with the mother? No, it does not have to be with the mother. It's whoever is caring for that child. So if the grandmother is taking care of the child, who is the primary care mother, uh, caregiver? The mother. Okay, so attachment is to anyone who loves the baby. It is not genetic. It is by environment. Okay, so when babies get adopted very, very quickly, uh, as soon as they're born, guess what? That primary caregiver is their adoptive parent. And there is no break in attachment. Okay, so attachment is under attachment in your uh, study guide. I would write Ainsworth because that's the chick behind it. Her name is right there. She's the chick behind attachment. It's Ainsworth. Okay, so she has four different types of attachments. The first one is going to be secure. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what you are striving for as a future potential parent. Now, if you don't want to be a parent, then just ignore me and just live your best life. No judgment here. But if you are going to be a parent, this is what you want, and this is better be what you're providing to that child. Or Miss Bennett will hunt you down. A secure attachment is a baby is willing to explore, it gets upset when the mother departs, and is easily soothed upon her return. Ladies and gentlemen, a secure attachment is the belief that the mother will come back. A secure attachment is the belief that the mother is responsible and will be there for the child. <clears throat> okay? So, have you ever seen a baby cry? Yes. Does that mean their mother is a bad mother? 
No, we're using mother, but primary caregiver, okay? When we talk about, when we talk about babies crying when a mother leaves, it depends on how quickly they are um, quelled when the mother returns, okay? So when we talk about attachments, we're going to see some bad moms here in a minute. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we're going to see them in full glory, okay? So, this is all based on Ainsworth and her secure attachment. A secure attachment, and this is what you should write in your application box, creates a strong, independent child, okay? So, a secure attachment creates a strong, independent child. We want our children to love us, correct? Correct especially when they're babies. Like, we want them to love us and play with us and want to be near us, but we also want them to be able to do things on their own. Can we agree? You don't want to have to, like, hold on to your kid the whole damn time. That would just be the worst, I would think. Okay? So, here we go. This experiment, which I watched through a two-way mirror, is designed to gauge how secure is the crucial relationship between mother and child. This bunny is going to go here, and that bunny will be on top value of the test has been established in studies that would watch a child one-year-old and then follow it up and interview them about their relationships to their parents when they were 21 years old. So we're quite confident in the long-term significance of this relationship. After several minutes play, the mother is signaled to leave the room. experiment is the child's reaction to her mother's return. The important clue is whether the baby's able to become calmed down by the contact with the mother and get back to play. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. You see? Okay. The so, out, as soon as the mom walked back in the room, in the what does the baby want? No interest in the toy. We picked up. And now, the moment the baby's picked up, what does the baby start doing? It's beginning to show a little oh, interest in the toy. Oh, I want to go over there now. Okay. This is what a secure attachment looks story. like. So you okay. call this a secure one? Yes. yes. Okay. That is a secure attachment. When the mother is gone, the child is upset. Everyone gets that. When the mother returns, or the primary caregiver, whatever, when the primary caregiver returns, that is when the baby needs that soothing, and as soon as they have that contact, then the baby wants to go start doing other things. A secure attachment. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the ideal. Does everyone in the world have a secure attachment? Do they have belief that their mother would come back? No, they don't. Next, we have avoidant attachments, which is unattached Explore without touching base. Ladies and gentlemen, these are children who don't want to be near their mother. Why would a child choose not to be near their mother? She's either abusive or negligent. If your mother is unreliable, well, even as small children, do we know that? Yes, absolutely. You may know someone who has unreliable parents. One of my best friends has an unreliable mother and lived with her grandmother because of how unreliable they were. Now, my best friend ended up developing a super secure attachment to her grandmother, so is she a happy human being today? For sure. She's um, one of the happiest people I know. She's in an incredible marriage. She is looking to grow her family. Like, she has an incredible job. She's absolutely incredible. So just because you don't have a secure attachment to your biological family, does that mean you're screwed and you will find no love? No. Does it make it a little harder? Yes. Okay. So, a secure attachment. Uh, avoidant attachment means the baby wants nothing to do with the mother because the mother has taught the child they are unreliable. <clears throat> okay? Ambivalent. 
Because I don't know what order the video goes in. So we're going to kind of see them all. Okay, ambivalent is when you have an insecurely attached child. The mother is sometimes present and sometimes not present. Okay? So, when the mother ups leaves, the baby's upset. When the mother returns, the baby is also upset. Why? Kaylee? Well, okay, yeah. They're confused because the mother is inconsistent. Sometimes she's present, sometimes she's a good mother, sometimes she's gone and a terrible mother and is gone for days and days and days and is unreliable. Okay? That is an ambivalent kid. It doesn't matter what the, the baby, the mother is there, they're going to be just as emotional as if she wasn't there. Okay? And that is because the mother has been inconsistent. Sometimes the mother's present, sometimes the mother is not. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm saying mother a lot. Can this happen with dads? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. The reason why I'm saying mother is because you're going to see a bunch of moms in the video clip I got. Okay? This is with moms and dads, for sure. However, there is one person typically a baby has a uh, attachment to. Does that make sense? Like, if you're a stay-at-home mom, guess who? Guess what? You're, well, you're a mom. You don't have to be a mom. My husband would love to be a stay-at-home dad. Go to the gym every day, make lunch at home, live the life. He would love to. Okay? And then you have disorganized, disoriented. These are kids who are just unresponsive to everything. They don't care when the mother is gone. They don't even notice when the mother returns. They have officially checked out. These are babies at one years old. Could you imagine what that kid has lived through at one years old where they have no care as in nothing is being processed? That type of trauma, dear Lord. So, now, looking forward, when we look at these types of attachments, Okay? When you have a secure attachment, which is the ideal, which every single person in this room, if you decide to have a child, is striving for, both the men and the women in this room, you are teaching them reliability, love, consistency, showing up. Okay? These are skills and things we want in people. See, they're excited about it too, man. They're passionate about attachments as well. Okay? These are things we want in good people. Happy people are this way. Okay? All right, here we go. So, let's see some bad moms, shall we? Watch him go. Goes to the door following her. Now, we, we sent the mother right back in, but the point here is not to distress the baby. We're just trying to challenge it. The baby puts her hands to her face. So, sad expression. as soon as the mom returns, face down. is the baby happy? When the baby's she literally picks her up, she puts her head down, her arms the out, and then... She sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. He's low-keyed. So you would call this insecure? Yes, attention. insecure. He's avoidant. He's, he's not engaging her, and it's not be, the reunion's not effective. And it's important to remember here that the thing that upset him was her absence. Her, re, her return should be the solution to his problem. So in your application this, box, ladies and gentlemen... And your application box for avoidant means when the mother returns, the baby is not happy. Okay? The baby is not happy and avoids eye contact. He avoids touching her. Did you see he literally recoiled when the mom was, like, touching him? Like, he, she, he just didn't want anything to do with her. Okay? And here is ambivalent. The pattern that we see in babies who are not good at using their mother as a secure base at home. This baby is also insecure. But you'll see, we got a look at his play before the separation. The mother's left. And when she returns, she picks him up. He can't calm down. He's still upset. She offers a toy to amuse him or to comfort him or to distract him, and he slaps it away. She offers another. He slaps it away. He's angry. He's, he's 
We call these babies resistant or ambivalent because they both want her back and yet can't use the contact. We think that the difficulty is that in the past, when he sought comfort, she's been inconsistent as to whether she's available and responsive or not. Do okay, so ambivalent is when the baby, when the mom leaves, the baby's upset. When the mom returns, the baby continues to be upset. Because what did the baby probably thought? The mom wasn't coming back, correct? And because of it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you see a baby having a meltdown in Publix today, are you going to be like, damn, insecure attachment, hot damn, that's what that is, that's a bad mom. Are you walking around like that? No. Okay? You have to... Some of you are like, yeah, absolutely. Like, insecure attachment. That's an ambivalent kid. You are inconsistent in your love. That's what you're going to walk up to them and say. I wouldn't. Kids have temper tantrums. Kids have meltdowns because they're overtired and lots of other causes. When you have an uh, area where you can do these types of studies, and then you can kind of test that type of thing. What do you got, Kay, uh, Camden? So what happens when the mom leaves and comes back for the disorganized? <sighs> Um, disorganized, disoriented. The kid doesn't cry when the mom leaves the room. And the mom, the kid doesn't even flinch when the mom enters the room. Nothing happens. It's not sad, it's devastating. That is a completely abused child. That's what that is. Uh, it's absolutely horrific. That's what that indicates. Okay, questions on attachment. All right, quick to the boards. Here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the name of the chick behind attachment? What's the name of the chick behind attachment? Good, I got one, two, three. Kelly? Ainsworth. Ainsworth. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just promised me you're going to have what type of attachment to your child? If you decide to have one, if you don't decide to have one, live your life. Go to Greece. <laughs> Go to Italy. Go live your fabulous self. What do you got, Margo? Secure on your whiteboard. What is a kid who has no response when his mother leaves and has no response when his mother returns? Literally did not even notice. What type of attachment is that? I got one, two, three. Ani. E. There you go. On your whiteboard, please tell me what type of attachment. When the mom leaves, the kid cries. When the mom returns, the kid cries for a minute or, like, for a second, and then comes, gets a hug, and is like, oh, wow, what's over here? And is distracted immediately by something fun. What is it, Olivia? Secure. secure. Guys, the secure attachment is when the mom leaves, the baby cries, okay? When the mom returns, they run to the mama, get a hug, and they're like, okay, mom is back. And they're like, oh, cool, what's over there? <laughs> okay, and they're ready to be refocused. What is it called? When the mom leaves, the baby cries. When the mom returns, the baby cries just as intently and is fearful that the mother would never return. No. Good. What is it, Sophia? Ambivalent. On your whiteboard, what is it called? When the mom leaves, the baby cries. When the mom comes back, the baby looks away, does not want to talk to it, does not want to touch, wants to keep to themselves. Curtis, avoid it on your whiteboard. What type of attachment? When the mom leaves, the baby cries. When the mom returns, the baby cries for like a minute, gets a hug, and then goes around the room and starts looking around and gets distracted. Okay, good. We had some problems with this one. Emerson. Secure. What is it called? When the mom leaves the room, the baby cries. When the mom comes back into the room, the baby keeps crying just as hard. What is that attachment called? Good. I got one. Hayden. Ambivalent. What is it called? When the mom leaves, the baby does not respond. When the mom comes back, the baby does not respond. Good. Annalise. Disorganized. Uh, disoriented. There you go. What is it called? When the mom leaves, the baby cries. But when the mom comes back, the baby wants nothing to do with her. 
Good. Jaden. Avoidant. Does that make sense? Does everyone feel a little bit better about the attachments? Yes. All right, here we go. <coughs> okay, and this is also one of my other favorite experiments. I love development. <laughs> Except for the whole, you know, sex ed part. Okay, so we have our attachment. We have all of that. Then we have Harlow's monkeys. Okay. Ah, you won't feel so warm-hearted for them in a moment. Harlow's monkeys on your focus. This is number six on your focus. And I would write it there. Okay. Harlow's monkeys is to see what cause. What is love? That is what his experiment is about. What is love? Is it the fact our mothers feed us? Or is it something else? What do you think? Why do we love our mothers? Huh? They got Yeah. No. According to Harlow, it's contact comfort. Okay? It's called contact comfort. You absolutely need to know that term. Okay? He believes the reason why we love the people we love is because of contact comfort. Okay, so this is the experiment, and you do need to take a couple notes, but look at my picture. This is a Remus monkey, okay? You need to know it's a Remus monkey, and it's spelled right there for you. It's a Rhesus, whatever it is, Rhesus monkey. You need to know. They use Rhesus monkeys. It's a big deal. Each monkey is given two mothers, a wire one and a cloth one. The wire one has food. The cloth one has nothing except cloth. Okay? Which one do you think the monkey spends all their time with? The cloth one. That's what gives it contact comfort. Now, ladies and gentlemen, some monkeys were only given one. Monkeys, these monkeys were immediately taken away. When they were born, they were immediately taken away from their real mother. So you can't do this experiment anymore. It's against, like, every rule. Okay? The monkeys were immediately taken away from their mother and given to, for instance, some monkeys were only given to a wire mother in a wire cage. So, ladies and gentlemen, how did they respond? No comfort anywhere in their whole little world. They're eventually going to commit suicide. They literally cut themselves on their cages and eventually commit suicide. Well, yeah, if you have no comfort anywhere in your world and you don't even know what comfort feels like, yeah, you would kill yourself too, wouldn't you? Hello? <laughs> I'm not supporting this. Okay, I'm not saying, like, do this to the monkeys, but it's true. The other side, monkeys who were given just a cloth mother who also fed them all are going to be happy, well-adjusted monkeys. Now, would they obviously be happier with a mother that responded to them? Of course. However, they ended up being pretty responsive and pretty... Um, happy-go-lucky. So, there's a couple major terms you need to know when you're discussing Harlow's monkeys. Harry Harlow is the guy who did the experiment. You need to know that. I put it underneath in the little box on your, folk, on your study guide. I'd write Harry Harlow. He's the guy behind the experiment. Harlow, <coughs> for this experiment, you need to know cloth mother, wire mother, rhesus monkey. Okay? Contact comfort. These are terms you need to know. Okay, he, Harlow believes it is contact comfort that forms attachment. So you know how we just talked about Ainsworth and her um, study of a secure attachment? The reason why that baby had a secure attachment to his mother is because he was comforted by the mother. Do you want to see some monkeys get tortured? Well, it's not the worst thing. We'll see some monkeys play. All right. Let me show you a monkey. By the way, that's Harry Harlow. Isn't that cool? Like, this is the real dude. This is like a real broadcast he did. That's Harry Harlow. Raised on a nursing wire mother. Now, here are 106's two mothers. As you can see, it was weaned on a wire mother. Weaned means fed. Here's baby 106. Watch. He's going to the wire mother. 
Got to eat to live. going back. He's back on the cloth, Mother, and he'll stay on the cloth, Mother. Actually, this baby spends from 17 to 18 hours a day on the cloth, Mother, and less than one hour a day on the wire, Mother. We had predicted that the variable of contact comfort would be a variable of measurable importance, but we were unprepared to find that it completely overwhelmed and overshadowed all other variables, including those of nursing. Frankly, Doctor, if it comes to a choice between wire and cloth, it's reasonable to expect that any child will go to the cloth. It's a matter of creature comfort, like a baby with its blanket. But is this really love? Well, what do you mean by saying that a baby loves its mother? Certainly one thing we mean is that it gets a great feeling of security in the presence of the mother. Now, Mr. Collingwood, wouldn't you say that if you frightened a baby, that it went running to its mother, was comforted, and then all the fear disappeared and was replaced by a complete sense of security, that baby loved its mother? Well, no. Now, in this experiment, this is the apparatus we use. That looks diabolical. That's, That's just the way the baby monkey feels about it. Flashing eyes, loud sounds, moving mechanical parts, all of these things are designed to frighten a monkey. Now here we have a peaceful, resting, baby mother. Let's find out what his reactions to his mother are when we frighten him. <laughs> He's scared, all right, and he does what any child will do in a similar situation. He runs away. It's more than running away. He was running to his mother to touch her, to drive away his fear. Contact with the mother changes his entire personality. Okay, so as soon as he touches her. Now he's actually okay. threatening. Now he's starting to respond. Screaming back at the little monster. Oh. Okay, so what type of attachment does he have? Part of the picture secure of attachment. And what build that secure attachment? This is a six foot Contact square room comfort. with a few toys and other objects. But to the monkey, it's much more menacing. We know that when our own children are taken to a strange place without their mothers, they are really often close, overwhelmed <laughs> with fear. This room is just such a new and strange environment for the baby monkeys. No mother is in there. Now, let's put a monkey into the room. <laughs> Okay, so there is no mother in the room. Okay, so is the baby going to confidently go through the room or not confidently? Not Notice confidently. how cautiously he enters the room. He's searching for comfort, but nothing relieves his disturbance. Now we'll take the baby monkey out and put in a wire mother. With a wire mother, is the monkey comforted or not? No. Now this one was nursed by a wire mother. That's right. All his life. She doesn't seem to help much. Okay, so just because now, he was fed by a we'll wire mother the doesn't mean he has the cloth mother in the room. You see the contrast in the behavior? Same monkey all the way through. Despite the fact the that the wire through. mother nursed him, she could offer this infant nothing in the way of affection or security. But here the monkey, by rubbing against the cloth mother, 
as if he was seeking as much contact comfort as he could get, builds up his reservoir so and of affection and ladies and gentlemen, you decide to spirit. have children, what is the most important First, thing that you can do? First, his body relaxes as the Touch fear them. disappears. Be there. Hold but above them. and beyond Battle this, new that positive is going response to form pattern that appears. secure attachment. <laughs> <laughs> he now goes out to explore and Once investigate the kid has new, that secure attachment, world. guess what? He is now They're going to be able to go out happy, and explore their whole little world baby. because you've created an independent person who believes that you will be there. So, when your parents say, well, of course you love me, you can say, no, I loved your contact comfort. <laughs> and that's what you can say. Like, you love me only for, your mo for my money. And you can say, no, I loved you for contact comfort. And now that's gone, so. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so that's Harlow. You need to know wire mother, cloth mother, rhesus monkey. You need to know contact comfort, secure attachment. Everyone good? All right, so Erickson's, your first four stages. By the way, I would fill this out on your focus, which is that big box. So how about I make your life a lot easier? How about I let you take a photo of this and we'll go back through so you don't have to go into your textbook because God forbid you open a book. Five. Four. Well, yeah, I'm not going to sit here for 20 minutes. You can take this. Four. Three. Two. One. All right, here's your next two. We'll go back. Five. Well, that's because you have an iPhone 11, you fancy fans. Three. Two, one. Okay? So here are the first four. So you can have all four. And here's the last eight. There you go. Oh my god, I feel like I'm really living a nightmare with all you people with the damn phones out. Can you do the first one? Kate is so demanding. Okay. So this is the chart that I would copy down, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> so uh, your first box is stage and age. So, stage is infant birth to one is in the first box. So, join me here. Put your phones down. I just gave you the information. So, worst case, you don't have to look in a book because God forbid. Why don't we start copying this down since we still have class, correct? So, let's get it down. So, infant one is your first stage. Okay? It's birth to year one. You're dealing with trust versus mistrust. Okay, trust versus mistrust is babies want to know if you're dependable. If I cry, will you come? That is the test. So when you hear a parent just saying, oh, I'm just like doing the crying therapy, let them cry themselves to sleep, uh, you don't do that in the first year. You definitely don't do that in the first year. And when they're like three, four years old and they're crying because they don't want to be in bed by themselves, then like, yeah, let them cry it out. They'll figure it out. But year one, you do not do that. <laughs> Because they're literally testing you because that's going to develop their feelings. Guys, you can keep going throughout the chart there, boss. It's literally right there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, listen to the story here, girl. So, summary of the crisis. Is if baby's needs are met, then the people they have, um, <clears throat> they expect, they trust people. If those needs are not being met, they do not trust people. Okay? Is that going to have a long-term effect? If babies are taught that people aren't trustworthy, will that have a positive impact on their life or a negative impact on their life? Yes, for sure. Okay? So, toddler, from one to three, they are struggling with autonomy versus shame and doubt. Okay? Kid, little toddlers want to control their own in behavior, okay? However, little kids don't want to be too independent. Have you ever taken, like, a one- to three-year-old away from their mom? Like, with permission, of course. Like, you're not kidnapping. Have you ever taken them away, and the whole time they just talk about their mom and how their mom misses them? Have you ever seen that nursery, that preschool kid, the news uh, reporter did, like, hey, it's your first day of school. You know, what do you think your mom's going, like, are you excited? He's like, yeah. Are you happy to be at school? And he's like, yeah. What do you think your mom's going to do all day? And he just started crying hysterically. I saw that. Yeah, it's hilarious. 
Because the kid is, like, so excited, so happy, and the guy asks one question, what do you think your mom's going to do all day? And he just starts crying. Because kids want to be independent, but they think you need them. <laughs> they think they, that you want to be taking care of every single need for them. So anytime they do something for themselves, they feel guilty you can't do it for them. So they're working through it. Um, stage three is preschool age for three to five. This is initiative versus guilt. Okay? They want to be in charge. Okay? However, they don't want to do something and make the decision themselves. They're like Samantha, the Bennett's trying to make deci dinner decisions. Where do you want to go to dinner? I don't know. Where do you want to go to dinner? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I swear, as you get older, once you get married, all you do is discuss what are you having for dinner. And it's literally the only conversation you have. With that being... If, if we had, like, a little wheel that we would spin that would pick our dinner restaurant, it would be great. Why don't you keep a list on your phone and then have a random chooser every time? Because we would then argue with that choice. I know. We're complicated. My husband had a meltdown two weeks ago because he couldn't make a decision. So I got takeout food, and he ate tuna from a can. <laughs> Well, it wasn't my fault. I did everything I possibly could. Like, I did everything I possibly could. I offered 5,000 different things. I said I'd pick up anything for him. There's three restaurants below us. He could not make a decision. He ate. He deserved the can of tuna. Okay? He deserved it. Okay. <clears throat> so initiative versus guilt. So there you go. We got a lot done today. Oh, my God. You people are the worst. There you go, girl. See ya. Tomorrow's test, I think, is pretty tricky. Not like super hard, but there's a lot of stuff on it. Can we agree? Yes. All right, goodbye. You don't have to write in full sentences. You know that, right? Yeah, I know. Okay, I feel like we talk about this on a regular basis, but I just want to double check. What's up? Yeah? Yeah.